Well, I think we love one another. Everyone feels pretty welcomed about now, don't we? Wonderful. That is wonderful. Um, in our, my, the Thursday morning Bible class, we have been studying the Gospel of Luke, and it's been quite interesting. Um, Luke wants us to understand the truth that's been circulating around this truth that's been circulating about Jesus. But he wants to do so by recounting some eyewitness testimonies. And so that's kind of what he lists here is some eyewitness accounts. Now, why would we want eyewitnesses? Because when we're looking for truth, if someone has seen something or heard something, they can then inform us in our seeking for truth, right? If there's one really good witness, that's pretty good. But if there are many who affirm the same information, that's all the better, isn't it? So he gets us all ready for these eyewitness accounts, and then he does this weaving thing of the conception and birth of John, whom we come to know as the Baptist, and the conception and birth of Jesus. Now, I've always been a little bit perturbed about all this talk about John. Why so? Why, have you ever wondered why is there so much about John? Well, John was quite beloved. He had a large following at the time that he died. So I believe that there are some that wondered if he wasn't the Messiah. After all, he did all the baptizing and uh, repentance of sin, didn't he? So I think there's some of that, but there's also parts of this story that inform us about who this child is, Jesus. So that's why. Who is this child born in a stable, and why should you and I care? Well, he calls his first witness, and his first witness is actually an angel, an angel of the Lord, and this happens in the temple. So in the temple, not just in the temple proper, but in the deepest part of the temple, the Holy of Holies, where people recognize that God lives. And there's this, high, this priest, Zechariah, who's in there, and he tells him uh, that he is going to his wife is going to have a child. Now, this couple is identified, the credibility of the, the witness here, as a blameless couple who were righteous, but yet they had not had a child. Almost sounds like the Abraham and Sarah story, doesn't it? This might be a good one. Uh, this might be the good place for a savior to be born, right? Fulfilling that story. So we've got this first testimony, that angel. And the thing is, it's credible because she does get pregnant, even though they're beyond years. The second witness is also an angel. This second angel has a name. Does anyone remember the name of the, of the angel? <laughs> Kids, do you know the name of the angel? Gabriel. So this one we know has a name, and he appears to Mary. Now, Mary is a young girl. Uh, she's engaged to be married, right? She's in Nazareth. This is way north from Jerusalem. I mean, she's a long ways from the temple, right? And she's a virgin, she's engaged to be married, and this angel tells her that she is going to bear a son. And he is going to be the son of the Most High. In other words, the son of God. And he's also going to be sitting on the throne of his ancestor David. She questions how this would happen, well, uh, and the angel tells her it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. So she humbly agrees to the plan. 
In the next scene, we get our third witness, perhaps one you hadn't thought of. Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, and when she arrives, the baby that's within Elizabeth leaps for joy. He's the third witness, and he leaps for joy because he's already prophesying and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And his mother, the one carrying him, she understands what this means. She understands because she says, how is it that the mother of my Lord would come to me? The mother of my Lord. So these two, they confirm the witness of the angel Gabriel. That Gabriel, things that happened just as, he, as that angel said. A credible witness. The next witness is Mary. Now Mary, in response to what um, Elizabeth has said, can you just imagine what Mary has been going through since that angel came to visit her and now she's pregnant? Can you just imagine how much she has been in prayer, seeking God, seeking to understand what all this means? She's, in other words, she's listening to God. She's listening to how God has acted through all of the ages up until now. And here's what she says in her beautiful uh, song of praise. She claims about God's mercy that extends to all generations, and she claims the strength of God, how God has worked in the past, that God has scattered the proud, brought down the powerful from thrones, lifted up the lowly, and sent the rich away empty. Powerful reminders of what God is up to. Then we have our next witness that uh, comes back on the scene at the time of John's birth. That's the father, Zechariah. Now, he's also been in prayer, you might say, because he was left deaf and dumb after uh, the angel appeared to him because, remember, he didn't believe. So he's come to believe, and he's been praying, trying to understand what this child is to be about. And so, at the time of John's birth, when his voice is restored, he claims that there is a mighty Savior being born from the house of David, saved from the hands of enemies, and fulfilling promises of mercy from of old, and faithfulness to the covenant of Abraham. That's what he sees happening at that time. And you'd think that maybe he was talking to John, prophesying that about John. But then he says, but you, child, speaking to John, you go before the Lord and prepare the way. You are the one that's going to proclaim salvation and forgiveness of sins. You are the one that's going to proclaim the tender mercy of our God and light to all who sit in the darkness in the shadow of death and guide us in paths of peace. So he says John is the one who goes before. He understands the mission. Now if you were, for any of us who have ever felt abused or used, or manipulated, or somehow hurt down and beat down by enemies, as these people were feeling at that time. Stevens explained that very well over the past few weeks. People who are living on only 80 to 90 percent of their income because they're so heavily taxed, they are treated as the poorest of the poor, the lowest of the low. But you and I, You and I also want to be saved from the hand of our enemies when we've been wrongly judged or wrongly accused or abused or used or if we've been victims of violence, whether that be physical or emotional or spiritual violence. 
in these words, we hear that cry for justice that we all long for, that hope to be saved and redeemed, a hope for a light that would come into that dark place. So these are all witnesses then that are leading us into the truth. Who is this child born in the town of David, the descendant of David? Well, the next story, according to Luke, is the story of Jesus' birth. The witness is again an angel who appears to shepherds. And the angel is the one that makes the announcement, this is good news of great joy for who? Who? All people. A Savior, a Messiah, the Lord, names him. Names him. But then he says, you're going to find this baby in a most unusual location, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. By the time that hearers are, have heard all of these stories, they've got to be wondering, how can it be this child? Because you see, John was born of priests, descendants of priests. Those people had status. Not among, but Jesus is not born among the priestly class. He's born of David, who also, remember, started as a lowly shepherd before he was king. In other words, the packaging does not reflect the contents. So then we come to our scripture for today. Who is this child? Could this be the one that Israel's been waiting for? And we get to hear two more witnesses. But first, let us pray. Lord God, we do thank you for this day, this day that we can look into your word and understand more about who you are and what we are to be doing. What we are to be doing, how we are to be responding. So, Lord, I pray that as these words continue to unfold for us, that you speak to us through the power of your spirit. We ask for this in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm reading to you from Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 22. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they, meaning Mary and Joseph, brought him, Jesus, up to the Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as is written in the law of the Lord, that every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel. And to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your soul also. There was also a prophet, a prophetess Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. Then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple 
but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, Mary and Joseph returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for you and I, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So now we get the story of what about the credibility of these parents? After all, they're not of the priestly class, are they? Is this worthy parents for a, the child, the Messiah, to be born? Well, they're very devout. They're following the Jewish law to the letter of the law. They have Jesus circumcised when he's eight days old, according to the law. They come at the time of purification, which is about 40 days after the birth. That's uh, when the, the flow of blood stops and the woman then can come and offer sacrifice to be purified. Now the normal sacrifice is a lamb and a dove or a pigeon. That's not what they offer here. It's two turtle doves. That's because if you can't afford a lamb and a dove, you can offer two turtle doves. These parents are poor. They're also presenting him to the Lord because the firstborn male is supposed to be presented to the Lord for service to the Lord. So that's what they're fulfilling here. And notice the location. It's the temple. This is the valid witness here in the temple, in the presence of the Lord, we meet the next witness, Simeon. Now this temple, this temple of Herod's, what is the likelihood of running into this couple as insignificant as they are and recognizing this child? This place is like somewhere between 25 and 36 acres in size. It's huge. It's massive. And yet led by the Holy Spirit, this man knows that he is going to meet the Lord's Messiah before he dies. He believes this promise. And so he listens and he waits and he prays. And then comes the answer to his prayer as he sees this child. He sees the child. And he says, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you prepared for all the peoples in the presence of all the peoples. So he's saying he can now die in peace because he's seen what has been promised. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. Salvation for all peoples. Light, revelation to the Gentiles and glory for the nation Israel. Do you hear how this witness confirmed the previous witness that said, this child is for all peoples. There's a universal message here. Israel was looking for its consolation. They're looking for the Messiah, but the Messiah who comes is not simply for Israel, but for you and for me. Who is this child? Well, through the actions of the parents and through this, the prophets, what we understand here is that he is actually quoting much of the prophet Isaiah. 
in these prophecies. So these people knew these stories. They knew who they were anticipating. And yet, what happens? The blessing tells us. In the blessing, he says, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed. Opposed. Why is it opposed if this is the message that we've been expecting? It's the message that the priests and the teachers teach, but it's not the message that they want, is it? Jesus is to be misunderstood, contradicted, rejected. You see, the words of the prophets tell us that this Messiah is coming bearing certain qualities. Qualities of compassion, qualities of inclusion, mercy and grace and humble service. And if, when we read the rest of the story, we hear words, we, hear, we see Jesus' actions that fulfill that, don't they? Jesus is compassionate, inclusive. He humbly serves others. And he extends mercy and grace. So even though these people are teaching the prophets, the priests who don't recognize this child, all through his life, because they are teaching exclusion, judgment, indifference or apathy and greed, and unfortunately, that still happens today, doesn't it? When we want the message, the Christ message, to be for my personal gain or for my institutional gain, it's altered. It's not the same. Who is this child? You see, this child is the one who lights up the darkness and is the pathway to peace. And he does so by disrupting the darkness, the destruction of the relational bonds that prevail, that exclusion and judgment, indifference and greed. This child is the revolutionary that upsets all of those things. He upset them then, and he's upsetting them now. And that's what every one of these witnesses point to. Who is this child but the Christ? The Old Testament word is Messiah. The New Testament word for the anointed one, the servant of the Lord that Isaiah speaks about is the Christ. Jesus the Christ. You see, Jesus the Christ came and he was eating with sinners and tax collectors and healing the sick and the lame and the demon-possessed and raising the dead. Jesus, then, the master, the teacher of compassion and inclusion and mercy and grace and humble service. Now, I've not forgotten Anna, because she's yet the other witness here, isn't she? She steps onto the scene just as Simeon is saying all these words. Now, the witness says that she also is devout. She's been living in the temple since the death of her um, husband. She's like 104 or 84, and people did not live to be that old back then, not like they do now. She's a credible witness. And immediately when she hears these words, she affirms them, and she begins to praise God and to tell everyone. She's also a witness. Well, who is this child? You've heard the eyewitness accounts that Luke has given us. You see, whether or not this is good news for you and I depends on what we've been waiting for. Someone to affirm ways of self-gain? Or have you been waiting for the God of compassion and mercy and grace and inclusion who leads us in acts of service? If this is what you've been waiting for, then this is good news. 
your Messiah, the Christ, has come. Let us pray.